Roger, looks good. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of NASA Spaceflight Live. I am your host, Thomas Burkhardt, editor and reporter for NASA Spaceflight, and I'm joined by Chris Bergen, the founder and managing editor of NASA Spaceflight. Chris, what a week it has been. How are you? Uh, we're fine. We're, I'm, just, I'm just glad we're not scrubbed this screen this because of what's been happening this week. It's been absolutely nuts with all the scrubs. So, yeah, we've got a lot to get through. Fortunate for us, there's not a lot of ground support equipment that goes into hosting NASA Spaceflight Live, so we are good to go. Uh, Chad, let us know that you can hear us all well. Uh, we also got Michael Baylor back around in the studio, uh, who will be helping us bring up some images and things like that and managing the overlay. Um, but we've got a lot to talk about, not least of which is the long string of scrubs. We've had one successful launch from here in the U.S. in like the past week and a half, despite dozens of attempts uh we'll get through that we also have a lot of news from spacex boca chica not least of which is the first parts of starship of uh, super heavy excuse me uh that have begun stacking so that is super exciting and of course lots of other miscellaneous space news that we love to talk about like every show it is interactive we want to answer questions so if you've got questions or comments about what we're talking about throw them into chat and if you tag us with at nasa space flight we will that will help us see those questions that we can answer as many as we can um and also a big thank you for everyone not just for tuning in but those who are members it's those who send in super chats those are the kind of things that allow us to do what we do but let's dive right into it with a review of what we're affectionately calling scrubtober uh started as scrub timber but now we're in october and scrubs are still happening let's start off with Monday morning, we had a scrub of a SpaceX Starlink mission uh, due to weather. That was a common factor in a lot of the scrubs. Weather was not cooperative. Um, we also had a ULA Delta IV Heavy mission that was scrubbed due to weather. And we actually had some awesome photos from Julia there um, because there was some heavy lightning in the area. It was actually preventing them from even rolling the MST back. You can see here, uh, we had some of her remote cameras got triggered by the lightning and caught this stuff. Um, but weather was plaguing Cape Canaveral for the early part of this week, prevented a couple launches. Um, and then due to another weather delay, we also had the Enroll 44 mission on Delta IV Heavy Scrub again uh, because they couldn't roll the mobile servicing tower back, which is a pre-launch item in the countdown. Um, so that was another weather-related scrub. Uh, once they did start to roll it back, they had some hydraulic issue on the ground side. So ground support equipment started to become a trend. That's why I made the joke earlier. Um, so that was a problem. And then finally, on Wednesday night, we actually got to a full-blown launch attempt uh, for the Delta IV Heavy mission. I got all the way down to seven seconds before the Rofis fired on the pad side. We'll go up into that in just a second. But the engine Rofis didn't ignite. We learned that there are two sets of Rofis, uh, basically sparklers that are used to burn off excess hydrogen in the air before engine ignition. Um, and Tori Bruno, the CEO of UNI Launch Alliance, went into a little bit of detail on that. Um, but basically, right at T minus seven seconds as the engine sequence was about to start, they aborted um, due to a ground support equipment issue. Um, so there was a scrub there. Uh, and then we go to Thursday morning with the next Starlink mission launch attempt. And that was scrubbed again to a due to a ground support equipment issue. An out of family ground system sensor reading is what SpaceX said. A photo of that scrub from NSF to Julia Bergeron. Um, and then we got to last night where we did finally get a launch. Um, it wasn't on the first attempt. Antares had a scrub earlier in the week too due to a ground support equipment issue. But we did finally get liftoff of the Antares rocket from North of Grumman, uh, lifted off from Wallet's flight facility in Virginia. Um, oh, this is, sorry, this is a video clip of the scrub. Like I said, they scrubbed first due to a ground support equipment issue. Um, and then last night, here we go. Last night, we finally had liftoff of Antares. I'm going to pull it up here. Uh, they managed to Resolve the ground support equipment issue, and Antares did lift off on her way to the ISS, carrying the Cygnus NG-14. 
spacecraft, the cargo spacecraft carrying cargo to the International Space Station. Um, that finally, after all those attempts, we got one launch. And I'm bl blasting out my eardrums with the volume for that video. Um, but we finally did have a launch. Shortly afterwards, we were supposed to have another launch, a Falcon 9 launch from Cape Canaveral with the GPS-3 SV-04 mission. And that scrubbed just 27 minutes after Antares uh, due to, I believe Elon said it was a uh, pump issue or some, some gas generator issue. I, I forget exactly what he said in his tweet. I'll pull that up in a second. I think it's turbo but, pumps. Turbo pumps. Okay. Yeah. So basically, we have one launch and a bunch of scrubs. Chris, what the heck is going on? What do you? Th what? Why is there some? Is this just a massive coincidence that all these launches are having issues? What? What's the make of all of this? No, I mean, there's been a lot of launches on the schedule. There's there's always lots more launches as there are from previous years. So there was always that chance we were going to have a, a schedule where it would all combine and, and also a concertina. But the problem is we can understand weather. Weather is something you can appreciate is a problem with Florida and other launch sites. So we can expect weather scrubs. But the run of GSC issues, which is ground support equipment, is unique. And it's more than a coincidence. Well, it is a coincidence, really, because they're different pads. But it's just ironic that a lot of the scrubs being caused by ground support equipment. Now, last night's GPS launch with Falcon 9 wasn't ground support as such, because Elon said it was a turbo pump. So that's the rocket itself. And that's why we're not seeing a fast turnaround to this launch yet. So it's unusual. It, it's amusing to the fans to do scrub turbo and what have you. But I'm sure to the companies involved, it, they're pulling their hair out. And they'll look like me eventually. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's both a coincidence and it's both something of concern. They've got a, Elon said in his tweet last night to reply to Tim, to reply to Tim Dodd, um, was frustrating because he sounded like they, he needed to go down there himself and oversee some of the improvements that are needed to achieve the flight, the launch cadence he wants next year, 48 launches. So, there's certainly some concern, shall we say concern that some items of the pad structure and which are slc 40 and also 39a needs to be modernized maybe i don't know we'll wait and see what happens there yeah definitely elon hinting that there he's going to do this uh yeah. okay thank you michael uh let's see he, he sounded frustrated for his tweet yeah. you know normally he's quite jovial on twitter that one yeah. seemed like quite a serious reply from him so yeah, he's saying we need lots of improvements to have a chance of completing 48 launches next year, and then goes on to say that they're going to review uh, a broad review of the launch site propulsion structures, avionics, range, and regulatory constraints this weekend, <laughs> and that it will be in the Cape to review hardware in person. Um, that pretty much lists every subsystem involved in a launch system, so basically they're reviewing everything. Um, and certainly wouldn't come from something like a minor issue. Clearly. Um, they want a substantial improvement in their launch cadence, which is amusing when you think that SpaceX is launching more than any other launch provider in the world, um, other than like China's state corporation. Other than that, all the commercial launch operators, both in the US and abroad, are not even close to SpaceX's launch cadence. And yet Elon's saying it's not good enough. Um, so we, we it'll just be interesting to a, see if it, there's. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, is it, we just know he's a very hands on guy. We know that when mm -hmm. Mary spots him turn up at Boca Chica Village, he's down there for a reason. He's down there for a, a, a milestone, or he's down there to check that the production cadence is up to spec for his likes. Mm -hmm. He's very hands-on. So th the most telling thing for me in that tweet was, I will also be at the Cape next week to review hardware in person. So, yeah, he's obviously not happy. And I don't, I, you wouldn't expect him to be happy. If he was laughing at it, you'd be more concerned. So, right. yeah, he's, he wants to be hands-on, which is great because he's the boss. He is the oversight boss. Gwen Shotwell in Los Angeles, in, in, in Hawthorne, California, who is running SpaceX. But Elon is oversight of everything. So that is a, a quite serious statement of intent that he wants to get things sorted out. So and it'll be interesting to see what comes from this. I mean, they could do small tweaks here and there that'll help optimize things or whatever, but I'm, I mean, given the tone of this tweet, I'm like imagining that there might be some pretty substantial changes. You can't really redesign any part of Falcon 9 because no. that vehicle is frozen 
in order to have a complete configuration to support the commercial crew program. They've done a lot of design iteration in the past, but they've reached the point where the design is is what it is basically. Um, and they, so they can't really make substantial changes there. So I'm wondering, obviously ground support equipment, I think they have more room to really make some changes if that's really the core issue. But the most recent scrub was a vehicle side issue. Um, maybe it's something they can change in their testing procedures or something like that. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see what exactly comes from that because it could be something pretty substantial. And if SpaceX wants to reach 48 launches in a year, that's that's a tall order. So we're going to have to wait and see. Um, but uh, yeah, let's dive into some super chats and stuff really quick. Uh, we've got a couple in the queue here. Uh, Darren with the super chat, thank you so much for your support. Uh, Nick, how old are these launch platforms and GSE decades? Uh, I believe that would depend on the launch site. Chris, we've got the three pads here at uh, Cape Canaveral that we're talking about are pad 40 and pad 39A, which are the two Falcon 9 pads. And then we have pad 37B, which is the Delta IV heavy pad. And all three of those have had some some ground issues in the last couple days. Um, what what what's where where are the ages of those respective pads? Yeah, it's an interesting question, but there's two ways of answering it. First of all, the likes of 39A go back to the 60s, and mm -hmm. these are old pads, but of course they modernize them all the time. 39A when it was handed over from Space Florida to SpaceX on a lease, SpaceX literally ripped the pad apart to revamp it. Only the fixed service structure remains from the shuttle era and some odd you know groundwork. But a lot of this, the infrastructure has been completely changed, not least because it's RP1 and short was locks and uh, liquid hydrogen. So they completely changed the, the whole fueling system and everything related to that. Uh, the thing with SLC40 is to remember that Amos 6, when it exploded during the static fire test, completely destroyed the pad. So they did completely revamp it then. So the age of the pad from when it was built is not relevant to the age of the pad's hardware. And it's ground support equipment. And the ground support equipment is what we've been looking at recently. So I, I'd be very cautious to look at the age of when the, the sites were built and consider when the hardware, the ground support equipment, uh, which relates to the rocket itself, when that was latest modernized. And I would think we're, talk, we're talking pretty much recent years rather than anything else. So, I, I mean, so do you think even though some of these parts might be older or younger than others, do you think age is coming into play? I mean, we look at Delta IV Heavy, the rocket that's nearing the end of its lifetime. Is, do you think that's a factor as far as the ground equipment or even the launch vehicle itself not being as reliable as some might expect? Uh, no, I think I think it's not. I think it's related to abundance of caution with all these late aborts, which are done by the computer system. They're not done by humans. They're not done by some launch director going, oh, oh better press the red button, hold, hold, hold. It's all automated software that's telling them something isn't quite right. Now, that automated software will be so tight, it'll be so restrictive on the parameters allowed that it'll, it might scrub a launch that could have launched perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. And that's how rockets work. And it's perfectly fine and correct to do it that way because you don't want your rocket to explode. We, we say scrubs, not ruds, which mm -hmm. is rapid unplanned disability. We don't want any ruds. So... These scrubs are annoying for the people concerned, the payloads and the, and the launch service provider, but it's better than it blowing up, you know, half of a, a minute into launch. So I, we've seen so many launches go fine. I don't think there's anything mm -hmm. wrong with the rockets. I think it's just the way that they've set up a launch countdown on automated software to say, look, check, 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 check. If you see something wrong, hold, hold, hold. And that's what we've seen happen. We've just seen a row of them. That's just the unfortunate thing about it. We mentioned earlier that Falcon 9 uh, takes a, a certain amount of time to recycle. You have ULA who has some built-in hold points in their countdown, which gives them a little extra time to address any issues as they come up in the countdown. Uh, SpaceX doesn't have that because their fueling timeline is based on the fact that they want to uh, load the propellant as late as possible to keep the as much propellant not boiled off in the tanks as possible for increased performance. Um, we saw ULA have a couple hold points, get down to the last seconds of the countdown, and still scrub. Um, do you think there's any chance that, you know, if the, if the space sets countdown was a little bit different, do you think some scrubs would have been avoided? Or is it a mute point? I mean, if you look at ULA, they do that in the countdown, and they still have scrubs because issues come up in the last couple seconds. Do you think yeah, that's a factor? I, I, not yet. I think if they, they keep having the same problem over and over again, they'll have to review it and do it differently. 
But right now, let's face it, ULA's never lost a rocket. So mm -hmm. these these scrubs, uh, maybe oh you will when you like scrub, everyone goes, Oh, you will like rubbish, they're so expensive. When SpaceX scrub, they're all like, Oh, never mind, Elon, all the best next time. So <laughs> you know, it's still a scrub, so you've got to take it as it is. But let's just consider the positives of what these parameters they're running from have achieved. They've had so many successful launches, especially SpaceX of late, and a lot a very high launch cadence. ULA don't have such a high launch cadence but they've never lost a vehicle. So why, you know, would we want to change anything? If if I was in charge, would I want to change anything? No, I wouldn't. I'd keep going. I'd fix the problems that have caused the scrubs and just try again. And if it's three or four mm -hmm. times and five or six times it happens, then you've got to review and look at things and change things. But they always say when you make a change with a rocket, this is back to the shuttle era, if you made a change to the vehicle, even if you thought it'd make things better, you might have downstream problems. So you might be making it worse overall. So to make changes is a big deal. And I, right now, I don't think we're anywhere, anywhere close to changes there. I think Elon's tweet was just to refine things, to make things you know more easier for them, to avoid these things in future. But I don't think he'll be there taking a spanner to Falcon 9 and changing things. So mm -hmm. nothing we're there yet. A couple more Super Chats. Uh, Jesse says, if everyone just gave $1. Thank you, Jesse. We appreciate the support. Uh, Dougal, a regular here on the stream with the Canadian Super Chat. Always excited for an NSF stream. Thanks, y'all. Thank you for the support. We appreciate it. Rough Rider Show, another regular on the stream. <laughs> Every says, time. Says, Scrub Virus. Yeah, the, the Cape Canaveral has caught the Scrub Virus, if you will. Uh, and Graham says they should start building the vertical integration tower soon at Complex 39A. That is something yeah. we are all very excitedly looking forward to. For those who are not aware, uh, SpaceX won uh, a bunch of money from the U.S. Department of Defense to build a new vertical integration tower or mobile servicing tower, or we're not exactly sure what the building will actually be called. Basically, a giant structure at Pad 39A, which will support vertical integration of payloads for national security missions, and that'll be used on Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy missions. Um, so they're going to start building that soon to support some future missions. Will be very cool to look for. And Rough Riders Show re-upping on the membership. We appreciate your support. Um, let's run through really quick where these missions stand as of now so we've had the antares mission which finally lifted off there are two spacex missions the falcon 9 from 39a which is carrying a starlink payload and the falcon 9 with the gps satellite which scrubbed last night the starlink mission we believe based on some hazard notices that have come out that is will not launch any earlier than monday morning um, SpaceX has not announced that launch target yet, which means they haven't fully committed to that, but that's probably the earliest uh, they could launch because they filed their airspace restrictions and things like that for a launch that morning. Um, so that's where Starlink is. The GPS satellite, we don't have any word on yet. Obviously, that just scrubbed last night. They're going to look at addressing the issue first. Um, that is to be determined. Uh, we'll wait on that. Um, and then the Delta IV Heavy mission uh, needs at probably at least a week since it's scrubbed uh, because they need to replace the end, uh, pad side uh, Rofi igniters, um, which is what fired right at the T-7 abort, um, which would put us, um, I believe, no earlier than next Monday. When was that abort? I got to check myself really quick. Uh, Wednesday. So next Wednesday um, would be kind of a no earlier than for that, but we haven't seen any airspace restrictions or anything like that. So that's a very loose target um uh, not even a target uh, we'll have to wait for ula um but so two of those missions are 2bt we do have starlink probably coming up next on monday morning um but let's take a look at some questions because we have a whole bunch here in the question queue uh let's see martin are the scrubs due to a pad failure rather than with the rockets all so i think all but one of the scrubs have been ground side right tris yeah apart from last night's which was vehicle and that, that was with GPS. That was obviously something wrong with the vehicle itself. But the rest have all been GP, uh, G, uh, ground support equipment, GSC. And one weather with the first Starlink scrub. So, yeah. That yeah, was and a bunch of the weather. early ones were weather. And then yeah. afterwards, they got farther in the countdown, discovered issues. It, yeah. it was a strange run of GSC issues, which is why I keep bringing it up. Because sometimes you have mm -hmm. like a, fail, uh, a scrub because of weather, scrub because of GSC, a scrub because of the rocket. This was a lot of GSC yeah. in between. So that's why we're bringing it up quite a lot. Uh, question, anyone know if they give GPS another try tonight? No, there will not be a GPS launch attempt tonight. Uh, that is to be determined. SpaceX is still addressing the technical issue that came up last night. Uh, so no GPS launch attempt tonight. Um, 
It is strange that SpaceX has more problems with brand new boosters as with flight proven <laughs> ones. Is that accurate? I mean, I yeah, I'm trying to think. I don't know if it's accurate, but it is amusing how it right. relates to flight proven boosters because everyone's thinking originally when they were going to start launching these boosters four or five times, be like, oh my God, that rocket's like on its last legs. And it'll be scrubbing mm-hmm. left, right, and center. But it's it they seem to be more reliable. That's why they've gone from reused to flight proven as, as uh, terminology for the rockets. I, I, it's amusing because obviously the crew, uh, the, the crew launch vehicles are new ones, like uh, Demo 2 is a brand new. Falcon, uh, Falcon 9, but um, that would have been checked left, right, and center before they launched it with the crew on board. So right. it, it's an interesting point there. It's because if you look at the two Falcon 9s right now, the one on pad 40 uh, is for the GPS mission, brand new, had yeah. a problem with the vehicle itself. The scrub over on the Starlink pad was not due to the rocket, it was due to the ground pad. So, and that small data set, you're right, it does look like the brand new boosters are actually more troublesome than the uh, flight proven ones, if you will. Um, so that's the other yeah, thing. So, can I, if I can quickly bring it up, Thomas, the other thing is the new boosters don't fire for the first ever time during this launch attempt. They're all fired at McGregor first. And I mm-hmm. believe SpaceX brought it up. Hans, uh, it was John Innsbrucker brought it up very cleverly because a lot of people don't really appreciate, especially uh, random viewers who maybe just get into this. But they do, once they're taken from Hawthorne, they take them to McGregor in Texas and fire them up, a proper fire up at the, like full duration rather than then static fire them at a okay, gate, which they've been doing less of recently. But the main test, the validation test, is at McGregor in Texas. So they have fired us up, they have fired us up before already. So technically it's a new booster, but it has fired. And this GPS booster did complete a static fire here at the Cape at Pad 40 ahead yeah. of the launch too. So there was another test firing that went successfully. The Starlink mission, I don't believe they did a static fire test at 39A once it got here. Obviously, it has flown to space and back several times. It has, they have confirmed that the booster works. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's, there's another difference there. And the new booster is the one that's having more issues. Let's see. Um... Uh, here's a question about Antares. We were talking about Antares earlier. Is there any meaningful discussion of Northrop Grumman replacing the Russian engines on the Antares rocket with American-made engines? So hmm. we know that, I'm going to ask a question, the Atlas V rocket that United Launch Alliance operates uh, also uses Russian-built engines on the first stage, and that rocket is being replaced by the ULA's new Vulcan rocket in part because of the Russian engines. They want to use American engines. Is there a similar plan with Northrop Grumman? I don't think so. I, I, I think, haven't heard of one. Yeah. The the thing with um, Antares was they they changed their engines already halfway through after the failure during that CRS-3 from Wallops, which was a dramatic uh, failure. Just seconds coming off the pad, they changed the engines then, but they're stuck with Russian engines or Ukrainian engines if you want to be careful. Uh, and I think they're quite happy with where they are now with Antares. I think their next evolution was going to be Omega, which, of course, has now been cancelled, which was an old solid vehicle, so a solid first stage at least. So, yeah, I think they're just happy being on their current contract without any major changes. I think the next thing to watch out with North Grumman is, is they're going to bring a new rocket online to allow the team that was working on Omega to work on a new vehicle. They may be looking for um, future launch contracts. The thing with North Grumman is they're one of the companies which, which works on the basis of contracts. That's why Omega came into being. There was a contract on offer, so they proposed a a vehicle for it, and that's how it works. So I think they need demand first rather than sort of like providing a launch vehicle that can then cater for a demand that's out there in the future. So right now I think they're sticking with with where they are. I believe the the – Removal of Russian engines was more of a mandate for national security missions, which Atlas V yeah. is a big part of, and Vulcan will take over from. Antares is used solely for Cygnus resupplies to the ISS, which is not a national security mission, uh, which is why there might not be a big a push to do that. But yeah, we haven't heard of um, any discussion about that. No. Good question, though. Uh, Future Martian, a regular in the chat with the Super Chat. This is by far the best YouTube show. Keep up the great work, guys. <laughs> Appreciate a future Martian. Uh, let's go. More questions. I'm just going to keep firing off. Could the overpressure scrub be to do with fuel contamination, hence GSC? So we're talking about the GPS um, issue last night. Uh, if, yeah, the issue, I, if the issue was on the vehicle side, do we know that it wasn't a like effect of a GSE issue? 
could have been, but I think just the way that Elon portrayed it as turbo pumps, it sounded very internal to the rocket itself, to me at least. Uh, could it be a GSC issue? Of course it could, because the rocket's linked up to the GSC as mm-hmm. they prepare for launch. The only time it's not with the GSC is when it has actually launched. So uh, could be. But I think we're, we're stretching a little bit to try and associate everything with GSC from now on. But no, I would stick with the rocket for now, while Elon has only said it was to do with the turbo pumps. That's all we can mm-hmm. do. We can only go into public information, and the only public, yeah. public information was turbo pumps. Uh, here's a good question from Martin. Could they not build in a wider launch window to allow for minor delays? So launch windows are not necessarily determined by arbitrarily arbitrary reasons um they are almost always due to limiting factors with orbital mechanics orbital physics um if you have a mission going to the iss for example uh you need to launch when the iss's orbit is basically directly overhead of you um, which is why on antares missions the launch window is only five minutes um for falcon 9 it also has like about a five or ten minute window but they usually just target the center so it's effectively an instantaneous window um when Atlas V launched a Cygnus spacecraft for Northrop Grumman, I believe it also had a very similar, very short window. Um, and that's all just because if you launched too far before or too far after, you wouldn't be in the correct orbit. Um, if you have launches such as the Starlink mission, that is also targeting a very precise orbital plane, um, which is why those launch windows are only about 10 minutes. Um, and again, that is not enough time to recycle a countdown if you abort in the last couple of seconds. Um, so... For missions like Delta IV Heavy, the NROL mission, that mission, uh, the physics of whatever orbit it's going into, uh, allows for a much wider launch window. That launch window was about, is about an hour um, for the most recent attempts, I believe. Um, so that gives them some time to work and work on issues, resolve, and then take another launch attempt in that same window. Um, but most missions, when they have those really constrained launch windows, um, you can't just arbitrarily make it wider. It literally is a physics issue, um, which is why you have to wait another day for another launch attempt, at least. Good question, though. Uh, let's see. Uh, what is included in ground support equipment? So what kind of systems are we talking about when we say ground support equipment, Chris? A, a lot of things. It'll probably take about 10 minutes to go through it all. But basically, if you think about... Everything on the pad that hooks up to the rocket and everything associated with the pad itself. So the lightning towers you see in that picture right now, that is technically ground support equipment. It's all to do with the pad, but I think the, the meat of the ground support equipment is the fueling part, the fuel and electronic lines, which are linked up to the rocket to fuel it and to keep health monitoring on it and to pass on to the launch control center. So that's all GSC. I would basically imagine everything to do with pumping the fuel into the rocket and all the wi- all the lines are connected to get data from the rocket as well, because lots of it's telemetry as well. So if you can imagine from the shuttle days, uh, there, we've got a video, I'm going to try and link it in the chat in a second, which shows the tail service mass retracting away from the vehicle as it launches. They were, I think it was 28 lines, which is both propellant, electronical, data, everything like that. And it's all pulled away at T0. And that is literally the GSC pulling away from the vehicle. So that that was a good, very good visual picture of what GSC looks like. Basically, I've pulled up another picture from Stephen Marr, one of NASA Space Flight's yeah. newest photographers. Uh, and you can see the pad. And I mean, things, you see a bunch of tanks on the ground. You see propellant lines. You see the lightning towers. You can see a little bit of the sound suppression water system at the base of the rocket. All of that is what we consider ground support equipment. Basically, anything that is used during launch but isn't actually on the rocket itself. Um, And then, of course, you have the transporter erector, the tower right next to the rocket, which carries all sorts of propeller lines and electrical lines and all that stuff. That's all ground support equipment. so it's, it is kind of a broad term. It's not to think that all of these GSC scrubs were the same thing. Um, that's not necessarily the case. It was all different parts of equipment that is on the ground. So that's the difference there. Uh, Yazada with the new membership. Thank you so much for the support. And Babinski, we know him. He writes a couple of our articles about Northrop Grumman tests yep. out in Utah. He's, he's there for NASA space flight. I remember the very dark days of 86, three straight launch explosions with Challenger, a Titan III, and a Delta. For a while, we couldn't even launch a grapefruit. Scrubtober is nothing compared to that. That is a very good point, uh, Justin. Like we said, scrubs, not ruds. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's important to be as safe as you possibly can. 
But let's uh, you have another. Oh yeah, question? Thomas, if you check if you check the back end, I've put it in uh, oh, that link like that to video? what I was yep. talking about because it's a great ten seconds of fun from Shuttle there. Here we go. It's 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 Chris's uh, one mention of Shuttle uh, as promised on every NASA <laughs> yeah. Space Flight live episode. Here we go. Uh, Nathan Barker, another photographer NASA Space Flight, tweeted this. You could see, oh yeah, so it's it's not only is the line which has looks dozens of actual connections into this one thing that actually connects to the rocket uh and this connects to the sh this connects to the orbiter right yeah there's one other side sls will work on the same basis and sls has got three of these they mm -hmm. are huge they're like four stories high they're deceptively large and these massive arms are pulled back by huge weights and then the door closes immediately just before the um to protect the them, rs25 right? rs25 exhaust hits it so it's it's an amazing little thing, but there's lots of these videos where they're engineering videos. They're done on purpose, not for visual fun. They're actually engineering videos where they can review back because if one of these had failed, where it wouldn't pull away from the vehicle, the the orbiter would have pulled the lines from the actual pad itself and flown with it, and that'd have been extremely bad for mm -hmm. first stage because the aerodynamics, one of you. So every time it worked, it worked perfectly. But that's GSE, folks. Yeah, that, that is GSC in action, correct? Yeah. Uh, here we go. Do you think these scrubs will have any effect on the Crew-1 launch, which has a new booster assigned as well? Any down-the-road manifest uh, effects that we're looking at right now, Chris? No, only if we want to start to be you know, a little bit more paranoid than we want to be. We don't need to be paranoid about these things. This is what happens. We're so used to these. We've been covering it for years and years. Scrubs happen. You know, aborts happen. In fact, I dare say that even with this latest run of scrubs and the bots, it's not as bad as I remember it being. I remember lots of bots and scrubs in the um, five, ten years ago. I mean, you look at SpaceX, Falcon 1. You, you, there's lots of examples where things have improved a lot. I think it's just a one-off set of coincidences that several different providers have had the same similar issue or, you know, at least scrubbed during this run of, run of this particular part of the schedule. I would not start to think oh about crew one i wouldn't just because it's a new booster as well i think it'll go fine i think these these problems will go away and we'll all forget about this within a few months mm -hmm. personally though i i think the starlink mission is it safe to say that this might be the last launch from pad 39a until crew one because we're getting close to the point where they'll want to keep that pad clear because crew one is such a high priority mission at the end of this month um, do you think they'll try and squeeze in another like Starlink mission or something, or are they going to move all their other missions over to Pad 40, um, like the GPS satellite mission, and leave 39 ready to go for Crew 1? You know what? I don't know, but I'll make an educated guess that they will leave it clear for Crew 1 now because I know from the flight readiness review experience that Pad structures is part of flight readiness review, review and they can't have these reviews and then launch something from it afterwards and then go back to review. They have to do what's called a Delta FRR, which is where they re-review the flight readiness review try to say not your teeth in it's it's you know it, it's not something i think they want to do for such a, a flagship mission and they've got pads available i think it'd be fine so i think this is the last one from 39 till crew one what are the other spacex manifests we're looking at we so we've got the two that are on the pad right now which mm. will hopefully go sooner rather than later um do we have anything else oh we do i i was forgetting is that I mystery one in... isn't it the zuma two <laughs> We're calling it Zuma 2, which is yeah. probably not what it actually is, but we're going to call it that until proven otherwise. <laughs> um, this is a tweet from Michael Baylor, who is, of course, also in the background, but uh, another reporter for NASA Space Flight. And there is this – so well, sometimes – little backstory when, when we first hear of launch timelines and where missions might be going in the order as far as like the upcoming manifest um all of these launches have to require uh fcc filings for their telemetry and data communication uh radio frequencies um and so we get all of these um filings for different missions now these uh especially when there's spacex missions uh the Filings uh, indicate where the first stage is going to land. Um, so we usually know it's a drone ship landing, and when we do that, it has the coordinates so we can find where the drone ship will be stationed, and that usually gives away which mission it is. If it's due to the east, it's probably a geostationary mission. If it's uh, not due east and it's on some different inclination, 
based on what the inclination is, we can tell what orbit it's going into and what mission it probably is. Um, and then sometimes we get one that says it's going to return to launch site and land at the concrete landing pads here at Cape Canaveral, landing zones one and two. Um, and we have one of these filings that had an RTLS mission. Um, when it first came up, we thought, oh, it's probably CRS-21 which is the first uh, SpaceX mission for the second phase of the commercial resupply missions. Um, it will use the new version of Cargo Dragon, Cargo Dragon 2, which is based on Crew Dragon. Um, but based on some other filings that go towards Dragon telemetry and tracking, um, we actually figured out that this filing does not go with that mission and that starting with CRS-21, uh, those missions will actually have drone ship recoveries, um, which likely due to the new version of Dragon being heavier and carrying more cargo, um, Falcon 9 can't come back to land at Cape Canaveral, so it's going to land on the ocean. But that left this one FCC filing that is a return to launch site mission, and no known missions on the SpaceX near-term manifest are expected to be able to return to launch site. There's a couple of geostationary missions, um, which will, of course, all require drone ship missions. Crew-1 and CRS-21 are both drone ship recoveries. Um, so this is a bit of a mystery. Now, this isn't the first time we've had a weird filing here because as we joked earlier, there was this mission called Zuma, which launched a couple years ago. Um, a lot of drama after the launch, but even ahead of the launch, it came up at the very last minute, um, this unannounced and highly classified national security mission, which we basically would just think sort of a rapid launch capability where the DOD customer went to SpaceX and said, we want to launch this very quickly. Um, and so it kind of came up at the last minute and they did successfully launch it. What happened after they reached orbit is a different story, um, but uh, they basically, basically rapidly responded with this launch. So this could be something similar to that. It could be something that we're just not seeing on the manifest. Chris, what are, what are the possibilities for this? Uh, no idea other than it just follows the same roadmap as Zuma. So, and the thing about Zuma is we've still not heard anything since, apart from it wasn't SpaceX's fault. It was Northrop Grumman's uh, payload adapter, which was at fault. Um, it is, yeah, Jack in chat saying Zuma is in orbit and doing fine. <laughs> you know what? I, there's a part of me that wonders if that is actually quite true because it's such a secret and such an expensive starlight. I think we're talking in a billion, in a billion plus range that what would be the perfect way to keep it hidden is to pretend it failed and that would stop the adversaries from looking for it. But I think with orbital tracking, you can, you can track everything for even X, right. you know, you know, X37s or whatever. So I, I don't think, I don't think it did survive, which is very unfortunate, but, it's following the same path as Zuma, so obviously whoever it is doesn't want to be um, revealing that it's obviously not a, com a commercial satellite from what we can tell. I think we'll just have to wait and see. I don't know what SpaceX will say about it. Maybe Elon will um, tweet something to give us a clue. You never know. I, I don't know. I wouldn't like to speculate what it is. Yeah, I think the first mention, like official acknowledgement that this mission exists might be when SpaceX rolls out a Falcon 9 and completes a static fire test and says targeting no earlier than whatever launch date for this mission, whatever the mission is, and we'll go, wait, what mission? We didn't, we never heard about this, and it'll be whatever this filing is for. Um, if the filing does start no earlier than October, so anytime this month we could see this uh, come to fruition, um, that is a no earlier than, so it could delay into uh, November or later. Um, but in theory, this this month we'll have this mystery mission coming up. Uh, Michael, did we just lose Chris B's video? I think we might have lost Chris B, and he's... we'll get we'll get Mr. Bergen back in just a second here. Um, but uh, yeah, so this weird mystery Falcon 9 mission coming up, that's pretty exciting. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we're, keep putting them in the chat. I want to keep getting through some questions um, about what we're talking about. Um, we also have a whole bunch of Starship stuff to get through that I, I know once we get Chris back, we're going to dive into a whole bunch of Starship news. Um, we're still working on getting Chris back, um, but I'll keep blabbering on about other stuff. Let's see. So we had a bunch of scrubs. We had this mystery mission. We did have a couple launches actually go off other than the Antares from the U.S. We also had some uh, international launches. We had a Chinese Long March 4B rocket, um, which was actually kind of interesting. Uh, it launched two civilian um, Earth observation satellites, um, but it also launched without any warning. Uh, China has this weird habit of 
kind of disregarding public safety when they do these launches. And one of the ways they do that is not closing off the airspace around their launch ranges. And this particular mission was not launched with any airspace restrictions around the launch site. So, um, oh, and Chris is back. Chris, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Okay, cool. I was just talking yeah, about I actually this. lost I actually lost all my internet, completely lost my internet. I thought that's great timing. <laughs> Hashtag get crispy Starlink. We need to get Starlink yeah. connection up in York. But uh, yeah, I was just talking about this weird Chinese launch that happened this week with the no airspace restrictions or anything. You remember this? Oh yeah. See that that's a bad thing. We we know China is notorious for landing its boosters on on local populations, even though they do like restrictions to to say, look, you know, we're not landing on people's houses. We're we're basically saying we're you know we're we're doing the exclusion zone and just not be in that area. But that means people film it, and it looks like it's landed on their house, and it does land on houses, but they've been evacuated. This one didn't have a notice to airmen, so this one was just completely out of the blue. There was no notice to anybody on the ground where this wasn't passing over over land, thankfully. But there was no notice to any passing planes. So uh, there could have been a, a nice video of a, a, a passenger plane passing by this area with a rocket going straight past its wing. So <laughs> that was um, not very good by the Chinese. And then we also had another launch, which is more conventional. We had a Russian Soyuz 2 rocket. I'll pull up the video really quick uh, with the Gonets M communication satellite, of a trio of Gonets satellites, and then a bunch of secondary payloads as well um, from various commercial companies, a lot of them from the US, a lot of them from Europe. Um, and that launch went successfully. So we had two international launches go off without a hitch, and plus the Antares from Virginia finally last night. Um, still waiting for those three American launches to come. We're also waiting for the next flight of Blue Origin's New Shepard rocket, which will be was supposed to happen a, a couple weeks ago, or last week, and that scrub had some um, technical issues, and they're still working that. So that's coming up as well. But uh, yeah, well, let's go into some more questions, and I want to bring up some Starship news. Chris, what's the latest down in Boca Chica? <laughs> what's the latest? Uh, there's no way to say what the latest is without spending 15 minutes going through every single vehicle. <laughs> there, there is so much going on. It is it is ridiculous. I keep saying this every time. Uh, you know, people say, why do you ever, why do you always start off star, Starship segments by saying it's crazy? Well, it is. <laughs> it really is. I've, I've never known anything like this in my life where there's been so many prototype vehicles being pumped out of Boca Chica and then being ready lined up for testing. Now, I think the only way we can do is go through each vehicle. SN5 and SN6, they both hopped. They've both hopped 150 meters, and they are now retired as far as we know. They've been moving around in a production site because they need to clear their way out of the high bay. They were in the high bay for a bit because there was a storm passing by, which didn't affect the area, thankfully. So they can now move out. They've been moved out of the high bay, and they can't go back into the mid bay because the mid bay has got SN9 and SN10 being built up inside there now. So... That's where we are with those vehicles. We've got SN8 out at the pad. I keep calling her SN6 by mistake because I'm I'm not my brain doesn't catch up with how fast they're moving across. So we're now calling SN8 SN8 <laughs> from now on. So we're given a special name where it gets around all the problems of trying to keep up with all these SN numbers. Now, if that picture there just been tweeted by Mary. She's just tweeted out that shows SN9 in the mid bay. It's one of those. I, there are look identical. I don't know SN6, the difference. I can't remember, <laughs> which is now, yeah. Yeah, there's a ring which identifies them. I can't tell from the screen I'm looking at right now. But anyway, that's SN9 in the mid bay right now. And that is now a full stack SN9. SN next to it on the left, on the right hand side of that view. And we do believe that Mary's been looking at engine sections for SN10 being moved in the production site. So we will have SN5, SN6, SN8 or SN8, SN9, and SN10 in production, in real assembly production. SN11, we know we've got parts for outside. And we've also now got parts sections, at least three or four sections for this first super heavy prototype, which is a prototype which will fly with two engines on a 150 meter hop which will look hilarious but that's what i want to do so far and that probably come after the progression of the test cycle with sn8 and sn9 which are both going to fly incrementally higher first down with fifty thousand feet and then hopefully landing 
Essen 9 is on backup because there's a chance Essen 8 could fail, which is the first time they've tested this vehicle to that height. And that's completely likely that it could happen on land and whatever, but they'll get data from what SN8 does and then put that into SN9. And they've got SN10 and SN11 to follow. And that's how they're testing. They've got all these vehicles ready to go. One fails. We've got a uh, related over. question. We were talking about scrubs earlier, and uh, Sean wants to know will the Starship Super Heavy sheer, sheer size make it less susceptible to weather related scrubs? So let's talk about I mean, these all these test vehicles are paving the way for operational Starship Super Heavy missions. What do you think the weather restrictions for a Starship Super Heavy launch is going to look like? Yeah. You know what? The funny thing, the, the most recent weather restriction was related to Starship, the lift of SN, of Snate, SN8, <laughs> onto the launch mount. They, they rolled her out to the launch site from the production facility, but they delayed the lift on the crane from the, uh, the, the little placement they put on there temporarily for the roll lift with the roll lift out and they, they were going to lift it onto the launch mount itself but they, they waited two days i think it was before the wind conditions allowed for that lift to take place how that relates to how starship behaves with high winds is a good question because remember sn6 hopped in quite windy conditions so they obviously can deal with those conditions quite well how the super heavy will react to winds remember we're talking about ground winds now is a, a very good question would it be better or worse i think such a tall structure on the mount launching would probably want winds probably thinking super heavy more powerful more heavy i don't know it's it's an inter interesting question but it's one where we've we've not seen much of a weather impact so far with the testing they've done so far with the starships the next test of the conditions will be thousand no. <laughs> kilometer 50,000 kilometer, 50,000 feet test launcher of SN8. And that'll be something we'll, where higher wind conditions will take place and, and come into play, especially with the test of the aero surfaces. So, yeah, wait and see. I don't think we really know yet if there's any improvements compared to other vehicles relating to weather just yet, because Boca Chica is mostly always very hot and humid. And um, wind is the main. I think oh, there's a lot of speculation that, that especially if you else. want to launch on these earth to earth services, where you're basically going to replace airliners with suborbital starship flights um, to have that kind of the launch cadence needs to do things like that. Your weather criteria need to be way l more lax than most orbital launches. And there's been some speculation that they might overbuild Starship Super Heavy, make it a little heavier, um, but in, in, so that it could withstand, uh, have higher strength and withstand some different weather conditions. Do you think they could do that? Uh, possibly. I think we're just going to wait and see. I. I... I would personally want to just keep an eye on one thing at a time, which would be SN8 mm -hmm. test next, as far as launch conditions. So I'm just going to do a quick check, by the way, my voice. Is my voice lagging or not? Because some people <laughs> say my voice is lagging. Uh, uh, Let me know if I am, because that's all right to me, because I'm in here <laughs> listening to myself. But let's do a, let's do a dust I can hear you fine, but I'm not hearing five, the same audio feed voice. that YouTube it's hears, you and okay, I can see your video is lagging a little bit. The video is lagging, but the voice is fine. Oh, we're we're getting the Yorkshire accent 100% correct, but the video isn't. Yeah. Well, when my internet went down, I went onto my phone's internet, so I might just change back when we get to the next, <laughs> edge, next section. But I think most people will be looking at the video rather than me. So <laughs> I don't think that's too much of a problem. So, yeah, as long as the voice is okay, that's fine. Uh, right. So, yeah, where we are right now is we're waiting for the, we're watching production. We're waiting for a test. So the production, we know we've got all these vehicles in production, including the first super heavy. What we want next is the test launch of SN8. And I think the next milestone is next week where they're going to do proof testing. So we're waiting for the proof testing, install the Raptors. They'll do a static fire test. We think the nurse cone will go on first. So we're waiting for the nurse cone to arrive at the launch site. Then we're going to get probably another static fire test. According to Elon, he's looking at two. We'll see. And then we get the test launch to 50,000 feet. And how that behaves to launch and landing will be so significant for all the other launches, all the other vehicles coming up. That is where my, my thought process is right now, 
is watching the production, watching for new vehicles. I know. I'm looking forward to that SNA test flight SNA because does. of that crucial belly flop landing maneuver. And I'm still, and I'll come out and say, I'm. I, they're working on a technical issue. Um, I'm just going to. All right. I'm going to reconnect. Okay, I was just going to say that the belly flop maneuver, I'm not sold on yet because I, obviously they haven't done it yet. So I want to see how that works. I'm super skeptical if that's even going to work. I hope it does because it is a really efficient maneuver, but it's dramatic and I'm definitely going to be watching the first time they try it. Um, that is some just some of the excitement we'll see when SN8 does lift off. Um, we do have a super chat here. Astro6, thanks for the super chat. Once production ramps up after successful testing, do we think that another site will be needed to open for more Starship manufacturing? I believe the expectation is they're going to have more production over on the East Coast. They did hint at that when Starship development first started, there was that site um, in Cocoa, Florida, near Cape Canaveral, um, where they built the Mark II prototype. Um, and that site has more or less gone quiet now. We believe that they're focusing on Boca Chica for the early research and development for Starship. But I think once Starship is ramping up into more operations, I think we're expecting them to have another production site in Florida um, so that they can be building Starships and Super Heavies at two different sites and launching them from both locations as well. Chris, I think we have you back. Yeah, let's see how that works now. I was literally, I lost the internet earlier. And I did, I did my backup thing. I'm going on my phone, which has got obviously like 4G. And that obviously wasn't good enough either. So something's going on in Yorkshire right now, which is affecting the internet. But I am now back on my regular internet, which is now working again. And hopefully that means I'm not talking over Thomas. All right. Sounds good. Um, we have another super chat here. Andre, who says, I have Starship withdrawal. Yeah, we're right there with you. Uh, I think we're all looking forward to that SN8 hop test. That'll be a good one. Uh, but yeah, we were just talking about, um, we think they're going to, when they ramp up into Starship operations, we're expecting more manufacturing to happen in Florida as well as Boca Chica, right? Yeah. Well, the thing is, they were going to work working on the basis of having Cooker and also Boca Chica. And they were going to duel it out. Elon was literally saying it was a competition between the two for the first Starships. And then all of a sudden, it all changed. And it all went to Boca Chica. And everything went to Boca Chica. Right now... They're not going to use Kokoa, the facility there. They're going to use a facility at Roberts Road. And we know Roberts Road is covered in mothball. There's nothing happening there. So and we also know 39A has got that little uh, super heavy starship mount, which has not worked on since. And it's completely different to the one which they've got in Boca Chica. So right now, the, the future plan is to use Florida, but everything is concentrated on Boca Chica. So everything is on Boca Chica right now. I'm going to dive right back into our question queue here. We have so many. Uh, <laughs> all right, here's a good question. Uh, getting into the opinion thing. Chris, Omar wants to know, do you think that SpaceX Starship will work? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Why is because, that? <laughs> well, be because of the people working on it. Rockets are only as good as people building it. They're only as good as people launching them. Uh, and a lot of the SpaceX experience base is involved with Starship now. I can use examples such as Lars Blackmore, who is one of the two, like Trip Harris, one of the two people who are really heavily responsible for the reason why Falcon 9 lands and lands successfully so many times, despite very high up aerospace people saying it would either fail several times or wouldn't be economically viable to do so. They have achieved something that people will say, will it work? Starship, will it work? The same people are involved. That's why I think it will work. I think it's new technology. I think we'll have failures. I think we'll have a lot of changes to make still, maybe along the basis of the baseline they've got right now. I think it's convalesced. I think Elon said it, the design is now convalesced into a point where they're happy with what they've got. But I think the test launches will dictate how much further they'll go with it. But I do think ultimately, because of the, launch, because of the cadence of production, the way they can take a failure and then recycle and test again so soon afterwards that just from the volume of production they've got and the volume of testing they're going to have, they will make a success out of it. Does SpaceX have any contingency plans in the events of problems moving the fins on Starship during a belly flop landing? So, so during the landing maneuver for Starship missions, it's going to kind of come in horizontally and then the big aerodynamic fins that they've seen installed are going to pivot and 
allow the starship to start pivoting towards a more upright position where the raptor engines will fire and it'll make a propulsive landing very similar to falcon 9 does right now um if those fins don't move is there other ways for starship to maneuver into its landing position it has attitude control thrusters and it has the raptors themselves which can gimbal but can it complete that maneuver without move if the fins fail to actuate do we know? Well, the, the question is of the fins actuating. But what we know is there's very little involved with the aerosurface apart from the, the, bring, the return. The actual maneuver to land the vehicle is mostly thrust vector control from the Raptors. Mostly. So I think the biggest problem they'd have is if the Raptors wouldn't, the thrust vector control failed on the Raptors. I think that's where you, you lose, you got more chance of losing the vehicle than anything with the actuators and the flaps. We all thought the flaps were going to be heavily involved with that maneuver. But then Elon corrected it and said it was mostly the Raptors. So I think that's my bigger cons my bigger point of answering it is saying as long as the thrust vector control system on the Raptors works, they should be okay. There you go. Um, what are the stainless steel material thickness used to build Starship and Super Heavy? How thick are those stainless steel rings that we're looking at? Didn't, didn't Tim ask, ask that question or something and Elon said it's thicker or something like that, and they're going to change it anyway. I can't remember the thickness of it, but it's not not particularly thick. And it, most rockets aren't; they're all working on pressure. Mm -hmm. And and we're, we're, we a lot of people compare it to the old Atlas rockets, and even the current uh, Centaur upper stage for Atlas does this, where it's only stable when it's pressurized. Correct? Is that is Starship that yeah. level? Um, or I think I think it can stand on its own without pressurization, but once you start putting propellant in, it needs to be pressurized, right? Yeah. The the, the thing is, um, Elon's recognized that through the lack of thickness in the material by saying a lot of stiffness to the bottom part of star of super heavy to make sure it doesn't buckle. So that's what that that gives you a good impression of how thin this the steel is. That they're going to need to add stiffness, and they do add stiffness to the, the bottom part of the vehicle to add some more rigidity to it and that, that'll allow it to not you know collapse. There's, I'm, I'm thinking at the same time as I'm talking, there's a video of a, an Atlas, I think it was an Atlas, something like that, literally just crumpling over when it mm -hmm. lost pressurization. <laughs> and that was a steel rocket. And Elon did recognize that as something that they'd actually looked at as a, a, something they want to avoid. So yeah, there will add stiffness to it. Uh, we did answer this question earlier. Will the nose cone be installed on SN8 or SNATE? And we're saying that, yes, uh, SN8 will go to a high altitude and high velocity test flight, which will require the nose cone. That's also why they started installing the aerodynamic services, the fins and things like that. Uh, what else are we expecting to be installed on SN8 that we haven't seen on other vehicles? Well, we see, first of all, the, the aft fins or flaps. We, we're still playing between aft and flaps and fins right now. They're the, they're the first time they've been installed in a vehicle that's going to fly. Now, Mark One had the flaps, but different design. Uh, but that was never going to fly, I don't think. I think they were looking at maybe giving it a, a fly test before they realized it was mostly for display for Elon's last year's presentation. Let's think about that for a second. The last presentation Elon gave from Boca Chica had the Mark One behind. And they've gone through all these vehicles since. The nurse cone itself is going to be a, a unique thing for a Starship that's going to launch off the launch pad and that will also have canards and flaps itself so that'll be new and uh i think it'll just look a lot more like the renders i think there'll be a lot more public interest in this one even than there was for s and five and s six even though there was a lot of interest in that i think this one will visually look more like a rocket and that's why more people will take notice of this saying right this is a big step up never mind the launch altitude this actually looks like a vehicle that i've seen on the renders on the on the cgi videos we've been putting out so I think that's the biggest thing for me is the aero surfaces and the nurse cone. Uh, Coco has a question. Will SNA do a hopper test before the actual flight? So we know uh, based on the most recent Elon tweet, it was two static fires and then the mm -hmm. high altitude flight. He didn't mention any sort of lower altitude flight. So I don't think we're expecting one. Could that, of course, that could change. Chris, what do you think? No, I don't think so. I think I think they've achieve what they want to know from the data gained by SN5 and SN6 with the 150 meter hops. I think that's, they were going to fly them more times. They're going to hop them more times. They're going to be a hop tag team. And in the end, they've only hopped once each, but that's because they've gone quite well. They've, they've not needed to refine it since. So I think they've now passed the point where they know what they can do with 150 meters. And now the next progression is the 50,000 kilometers, which itself has been brought down from higher altitudes from previous test objectives. But I think now, 
they are moved on to the 50,000 50, feet test launch. And that is what I'll do next. No more hops, apart from the super heavy booster. And the things they'll learn on that, they'll have a mid-air in-flight in, in relight of the Raptor engines, three Raptor yeah. engines. So that'll be a new bit. Probably the belly flop landing maneuver um, where it comes in horizontal and then pitches up at the last second. Um, and then, of course, all the systems with the nose cone and the uh, actuating fins, control services, all of that is all new things that can only be tested on those high altitude flights. So we're not expecting a lower altitude hop test uh, like with some of the other vehicles. Uh, when do you think we will see titanium grid fins come to Boca Chica? We're expecting grid fins on the super heavy booster, right? Yeah, they're, they're very expensive. And that, I think that's one of the things Elon was concerned about when we they lost a few boosts, lost one boost to the, to the water. It was a water abort landing. And I think the main thing they wanted back was not just the engines, but the grid fins, because the titanium grid fins, and it cost a lot of money. So when would he want to fly them on a, on a test vehicle? It's a very good question because the risk of losing the test vehicle is quite high. And then you might have a, a crater event where you'd lose the grid fins as well. So I think it might be a while off. I think if they're going to put grid fins on them, they'll put probably the previous alternates on. So it's just like a metal, a, a cheaper metal version of them. We'll have, to, we'll have to wait and see on that, but I think they'll avoid titanium for a bit. Do you think that the first super heavy launch might just not even have any grid fins? Mm. Well, the, the, they won't need it for the hop. We know that much. Right. 100 meter hops. So it'd be, it'd be a question of when the next super heavy with multiple engines launches. And if they want to bring you back for a landing from a high altitude, I think, the, you know, grid fins are many for the. The, the main part of re-entry so re-entry and landing when they actually get some kind of air surfaces going so i think maybe down the line i, w I wouldn't like to i wouldn't like to guess hmm. so we'll, we'll keep an eye on that but there you go uh, uh dave has a good question why is there so much work on the vehicles especially inside the locks and methane tanks after the vehicle is rolled out so we see them roll it out from the production site it goes out to the launch site and then it sits on launch mount and they work on it a whole bunch um why are they doing it out there versus maybe at the production site what what, what do you think they're working on uh no idea i think w we've seen uh sn8 and sn9 we've seen them working inside that manhole just where they can put parts and and regularly you know different elements we don't actually we haven't identified yet inside the vehicle so they actually are still constructing the vehicle from the inside before rollout after rollout is something we've seen as well and i we've not really seen anything which we can say ah oh, they're putting this part inside the tank they're putting this side you know part inside so i think it's just checking over the um, internals of the vehicle making sure that there's no foreign object debris which is something called fod which they don't want to see inside the vehicle uh, but as far as the actual processing goes, they've never revealed what they actually do as part of a processing flow for the vehicles, unlike other vehicles we know. So we're, we're guessing again, and I wouldn't like to guess, but obviously it's something critical to the pre-launch preparations. Can we keep the questions coming? Uh, Elon said at the Tesla battery event that they are planning to build a wind-powered LOX factory at Boca Chica. Do you think that is what they're doing at the old well spot? Chris, what do you think? possible i mean again i think that that area they're building right at the oil well site which we've called it before is there's not a lot of work going on there uh, we do know that that's something that'll be on their brief to try and look for renewable energy such as their uh, whole brief with the solar panels they've got lined up there already uh, and that's what they're going to do methane recondensing with i i don't know i i would like to think that's what they're going to do because they'll take advantage of the conditions there and it makes sense to do so. But I think there's a lot of guessing going on in certain people doing their, you know, their commentary videos, usually over our content. And then, <laughs> and then, uh, then you know, the, the people start asking the questions if it's a fact. We don't know yet. Uh, Jessica wants to know, does the SN8 have RCS thrusters? We know it will get it at some point. We know they need attitude control thrusters, uh, especially for such a high altitude flight. It's part of its maneuverability. Um, we haven't seen the RCS thrusters get installed yet, though, right, Chris? Yeah, just a quick answer. I've got an answer to that wind, by, wind turbine question. Is not they're not doing that. So obviously that's oh, one okay. of those speculated videos, you know, the water tower videos, where they claim things and then we get asked the question. But no, we're, we're told not. Sorry, what was the second question? 
uh, does we? I was just talking. Uh, we know they're expecting RCS thrusters on SN8, but the question is, does it have them yet? Are they have they been installed? Uh, I've not seen them yet, but uh, I, I do know so that either. yeah, a lot of these structures inside the vehicle now. We've seen no CRPVs on the outside on SN8 because I was going to fly uh, to a much higher altitude that it doesn't want those those effects on the air surfaces. So I think a lot of internal work will go on, and we'll have to keep an eye on it from there. On a similar topic, as far as things that SN8 will need, it will need some Raptors. We know we saw one Raptor leaving the site, which is probably a flown Raptor going back to McGregor or something like that. Um, any new Raptors showing up in Boca Chica, where are the Raptors that will power SN8's static fires and flight tests? If you watch Mary's video last night, and if you didn't, you're going to have to watch it now. You can see there's a Raptor on a truck. Now, that the way that, that Raptor on the truck, it looked like he was going back to McGregor maybe for testing, which means there are three Raptors somewhere. For SNA or Snate. <laughs> and then we'll have to wait and see if they um they are spotted by Mary because Mary does spot raptors really well. And if we do see, there we go. There's a there's a rapture in question. We don't know if that's coming or going. We think it was going. So we we're waiting for hopefully some raptors with some numbers on them so we can get we can get some information there which ones are gonna fly with SNA. But so far we've not seen them. So again, there's a long way to go before they're needed. They're going to do this cryo testing first. They're going to have to put a nurse cone on with it next, and then they'll start installing the Raptors. And they just got to come from McGregor. We do know McGregor's past SM40 in the production and the testing. So they have Raptors, and they've just got to wait and see which ones are going to be flying with SN8. Well, we know they're going to need three for SN8 for its hop test. We know they need two for the first super heavy hop test, which at the pace of that they're stacking super heavy, by the time we have the show next week, we might have uh, almost completed giant super heavy stacks waiting for us. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's going to come sooner than we think. Um, but uh, so there's like five Raptors that we know they need. Um, assuming SN9 is an identical uh, version of SN8 kind of as a backup that will probably need its own three Raptors um, and we know I mean what serial number for Raptor are we up to at this point as far as testing goes do we know about like about no we don't but Gary's photo is an L2 if you're not an L2 member you should be and that is <laughs> that will show he, he does fly obviously every week and we, we're seeing Raptors on the two horizontal stands and one on the vertical tripod stand and we we don't know if they've swapped them out, but we do know that a, a vacuum raptor, which we've seen SpaceX tweet a picture of firing up, that's now off the stand from what we can tell. So they're going to put another raptor on there. So that I mean, they're testing three raptors at a time, technically, not all at the same time, but they're, they're going through that kind of cadence. And I just know that from when I asked Elon a few months ago what SM they were up to with the raptors at McGregor, he said SM40. So we can we can and that guess. was a bit ago so they're past yeah, that at this we, point we can guess they might be able to test on 50 by now we could guess that i just don't know I, I think it's a question next time we get a good picture of some raptors on the stand from gary and we put in an article which i might do on sunday is that we then ask elon i, I hate atting elon because he gets so many people <laughs> atting him on every single thing you know at elon i just went to the toilet at elon and then tagging you know, <laughs> you know, for desperation that it'll reply to them. So I hate doing it. And that's why I'll, I'll leave it to a question like, you know, how many Raptors are you up to now? Are you got Raptors for SN8? And hopefully he'll answer that. But maybe I'll leave it a few days because he might be angry about his scrubs. <laughs> <laughs> now, the focus has certainly been on Keep Canaver recently, but still going on at Boca Chica. And yeah, and, you know, some people ask, you know, is Raptor going to be a short, a long pull for getting these vehicles off the ground? Um, at, at least for the near term when these test flights only need a couple of Raptors. We know they're, you know, in the 40s or maybe even 50s now as far as Raptors that they've built. I don't think there's a Raptor shortage for these near term flights. Now, a little down the road, when you want to launch a Super Heavy to orbit, you're going to need 20 something Raptors at one time, which yeah. is a much taller order. So. But by the time we're ready for that, I think the I don't I don't right now I don't see Raptors as like sort of a limiting factor as far as getting these off the ground. I think it still is completing the test programs for SN8 and super heavy hops and things like that uh, before you get to those more like getting close to like an orbital launch attempt, which is the ones that will need all the Raptor engines. Um, right now, I don't see Raptor as the limiting factor. Is that a fair assessment? Do you think? Yeah. I think so. I think the only the only pause I've got in that is because they're building so many starships. They're, they're mm -hmm. up to potentially SN13 as far as parts. Like parts we've seen lying yeah. around, yeah. But the other factor is they could swap Raptors out from flight and you know flight Raptor engines, and they might do that on purpose just to see how they do with reflights. So 
let's say we've got three Raptors allocated for S and eight. They could fly S and eight, and S and eight could land, and they'd be everyone would be like, "Wow, that's amazing!" And rightly so. And then they could take those three Raptor engines and say, "Right there, we'll allocate to the next flight we do," and so on and so on and so on. So I think there's at least one Raptor out there from maybe S. Well, S and five had a bit of a fire, didn't it? That engine had a bit of a fire. They might have refurbished it. I don't know. SN6 is Raptor. Is that SN6 is Raptor right there? We don't know. So they, they do have Raptors that can rotate round, and that why that's why we'd have to think if they don't get to SN100 at McGregor, they won't have a super heavy or something like that. They'll just keep recycling the engines and putting them through a loop. So, yeah, I, I don't think it's a limiting factor yet, but the, the pause was because of the amount of Starships that got built there already. A uh, quick super chat from Marjokia. I've seen you in chat before. Will Starship fly? I think not. Well, I can confidently say the Starship will fly at some point. I don't think anyone's in <laughs> doubt of that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to add to that. Um, I'm going to disagree with you on that, but we appreciate the super chat. Um, here, here's a question on the SN8 test complaint. Will SN8 have a flight termination system, an FTS? Um, well, if they lift off initially, um, and we know that's going to be a pretty high altitude flight, there's been some guesswork that they might target the trajectory where it's going to, if it, you know, if the Raptors don't relight successfully, it'll just land in the ocean versus cratering next to the Boca Chica facility. Um, is there a chance that there will be a flight termination system? I don't think there's been one on previous flights that have gone to low altitude. Uh, Chris, Chris, what do you think? Uh, you know, I'm trying to remember what Tim said. Tim Dobb was on his um, Alucas Future, and he was asked that question. I'm sure he, he um, I, I can't remember what his answer was. <laughs> but I think there was a question of the two ways of doing a termination is obviously having a, a self-destruct mechanism inside the vehicle, which makes it go boom, and that destroys the vehicle, or cutting the engines. But would you want to cut the engines in a certain abort scenario where the thing is heading towards Mexico? So, you know, I, I wonder if they've got some kind of termination structure inside it where they can just trigger it and then say, bye-bye, Starship, you've gone off course. Um, you will cause no one any problems because we've just destroyed you, rather than just cutting the engines and letting it fly off on its can on its wings all the way to Mexico, <laughs> giving those folks a surprise. So I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to edge towards yes, because there's quite a population around the area, like South Padre Island. You don't want this thing just cutting its engines and floating towards the Padre Island. Uh, another super chat. James just says, dropping in to show my support. Thanks, guys. We appreciate your support. Thanks for all the super chats and the memberships. That's what allows us to do what we do and put these shows on and talk about all these things, bring live coverage. Um, it goes into Mary, who was, of course, the one reason we get all of these photos and videos from Boca Chica. Can't thank her enough. And that's why we know as much as we do about Starship development. So, again, appreciate all the support, everybody. Um, oh, we have another one here. Have they then used the same Raptor engine on the hops? The, I'm no. assuming that's talking about the SN5 and SN6 hops. Those were two yeah. different Raptors, right? They were. Yeah, good question, that, because a lot of people do assume that it's the same Raptor. It wasn't. There were two different Raptors. I can't remember the serial numbers. It was SN27 and SN29, I think. That, that sounds were, right, yeah. Yeah, they were the two Raptors, so they did do different Raptors. And also on SN4, which exploded the pad, they, they used two Raptors on that. They fired it up. So they did lots of testing on SN4. And they changed the Raptor out during the testing. And then the one, the lost one Raptor when obviously SM4 exploded during testing. So they do do move the Raptors around quite a lot, but there were different Raptors for the two hops. Uh, we had a question here from Robert, a super chat question. Will one Raptor engine is equal to how many Merlin engines? Oh. Uh, should I Google like thrust figures yeah. really quick? Google it. All right, hold on. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, so I'm on the SpaceX website. Raptor's thrust is listed at two megadoons, 440 uh, kilopounds of force. All right, and I got to go find their Merlin engines because the numbers change every once in a while as they go through development and things, and I don't want to mess it up. Uh, let's see. Merlin says 845 kilonewtons, and that's versus two meganewtons. So hold on, I got to do math. Hold on. Breaking out the calculator. Two meganewtons and for the kilonewtons. So it's going to take just under two and a half Merlins to equal the thrust of a Raptor. There you go. So just oh, more than twice the thrust of a Merlin. 
to answer your now, question. Now imagine twenty eight of those on a super heavy. And yeah, so and Falcon Falcon Heavy's got twenty seven Merlins. Yeah. More than double that is for one or well so each of those more than doubled when you have twenty something raptors on a super heavy. That's that's gonna be loud and it's gonna be awesome. And that's why he's gonna launch them not from land, he's gonna launch them yeah. from a sea platform because obviously with um that amount of thrust coming from a super heavy a, a, a 28 engine super heavy that will break windows in south powdery island no mm-hmm. mind look you know Boca chica village that that would be a lot so that's why they're moving them out and hopefully that means the, re- the restriction of the local population will be less because now that we're talking more like a normal ratio with the engines that will fire on land which is the three raptors on sn8 for example it'll be loud but it won't be damaging and I think anyone who claims it'd be damaging, such as, you know, whatever, uh, maybe over-exaggerating it a little bit, it'll be allowed, it'd be fun to watch, but it won't be anything like a super heavy launcher from land. That would break windows. <laughs> uh, we have another question here. Mary spotted a COPV in the thrust skirt for the Starship. Will that be too hot an area for the COPVs? Well, I think SpaceX wouldn't have put it there if it's going to have an <laughs> issue. Surely they would have checked those things. Yeah. But it is worth noting that they have moved a lot of the structures that we kind of saw just bolted to the side of like SN5 and SN6. They've moved them inside um, and they might uh, put some more inside the nose cone area once they put that on SN8. Um, and the reason for that has got to be SN8 is going to go to a very high altitude and the aerodynamics are so much more important for this vehicle versus the other ones. You can't just have things bolted to the side, a mass simulator sitting on top with no nose cone. Can't do that when you're going all the way up to 50,000 feet. You're going to reach so high speeds. Plus the belly flop maneuver on the way down is so important. So um, an important note, but I, I, SpaceX does check these things out before they move things and they know whether or not the CBV is safe in that location. Um, so that's my question to that answer to that. Um, <laughs> there's, there's some space action watching this saying you know what lads we didn't think about this did we what we'll put a CPV there for <laughs> thomas just said it's a bad idea oh, dear. <laughs> um we've got a bunch of que- oh here's a good question i wanted to bring this up um so we were talking about cargo dragon earlier i'm going to pivot away to some other spacex things that aren't starship uh what are the differences between cargo dragon 2 and crew dragon i know they use the same pressure vessel but what else do they differ on I'm going to bring up a photo because SpaceX recently, there was a briefing yeah. on the Crew-1 mission, and they did briefly mention the CRS-21 Cargo Dragon, the first Cargo Dragon 2. They've got a photo of it here. Um, what are some differences we're looking at between Cargo Dragon and crew, Cargo Dragon 2 and Crew Dragon? That's a great pitch, by the way. That's CRS-21, isn't it? That's CRS-21. Yeah, that's the first Cargo yeah. Dragon 2. And it's still, you can it, see it's missing a lot of things right now because they're still yeah. building it. Um, that's well, coming up, um, I think, next month is... Uh, no earlier than for Cargo Dragon 2. So if you had some time to finish up this capsule here, um, see, there's a lot the, of commonality, but... Yeah, I, I love this because we've we've got so used to calling Dragon 2 Crew Dragon that we've now got to go back to Crew 2 Cargo to recognize the fact that this is not a crewed vehicle, but it is the same design and they're just the same commonality with it. But the difference is it's all dedicated, dedicated towards cargo and that's including the trunk section like the old Cargo Dragons. So it's the same kind of thing. It's just the full advancement of all the benefits from the Crew Dragon design. So you have all of them pressurized capability with the trunk, and you've got all that area, that space, that quite large space inside what would be the crew cabin, which is the pressurized car- uh, cargo area. So I-, I love this vehicle. I think it's great. I think it's a wonderful idea that they retired the, the old cargo, the old Dragon 1 cargo vehicle, and allowed the variant of the crew vehicle to do cargo as well. Because not only will it be useful for the amount of upmass it can take, it will also be very useful for helping the data set for all the other all crew dragons because it's the same kind of design. So, yeah, when you ask about the differences in design, not a lot, really. Not from, not from what I can see from the capability side of things. So that's what I would say. It's even got the, the window sections for it. You know? Yeah. I think they just use the same pressure vessel. And yeah. so we might see when they put the exterior kind of shell on the vehicle, they might actually cover up the windows because obviously they'll really need windows when there's no people on board. Um, I know one big thing that will probably be different. We're not expecting them to have the Super Drago engines mounted on the side because you don't need an abort system. It's not a crew vehicle. Um, but we, we haven't actually gotten a firm answer on that. I think that's what we are expecting, but we haven't actually like confirmed that they could just have the Super Dragos on anyway. Um, I, I don't know if we have a full answer on that. I don't think we're expecting it, though. Um, 
and yeah, but it is basically just you know the crew dragon vehicle, the new dragon version two, will be able to carry more cargo. It's bigger and heavier, which is why, like we mentioned earlier, those missions are going to be drone ship recoveries versus return to launch site recoveries. Um, but yeah, it's just to increase payload capacity is the biggest thing that they're doing here, um, and I think they also plan it so that once crew dragon was online and crew dragon of course had a bunch of design changes in order to support the crew on board um i think a big part of it will simply be they want to have a bunch of commonality between the two versions of dragon which will aid make manufacturing a lot easier um, and yeah. getting these dragons prepared um they also probably incorporated a lot of lessons learned they were reusing cargo dragons near the end of the cargo dragon one phase of commercial resupply i think they probably incorporated a lot of lessons learned about how to make a capsule very reusable so that they can continue doing that not only for crew dragon because the crew dragon capsules will be reused um, but the cargo dragon twos will also certainly be reusable and they're going to incorporate any uh lessons learned in that area um i remember when dragon version 2 was first unveiled um elon in his presentation which was sitting underneath one of the old cargo dragons i think the first one um said you know we built cargo dragon it works pretty well but we didn't really know what we were doing um when we were building a new orbital spaceship and so i think they're all of the lessons learned from 20 Cargo Dragon 1 missions um, are going to be incorporated into the new Cargo Dragon 2 and Crew Dragon vehicles um, to make it as best a vehicle as they can make it. Um, let's see here. Uh, well, okay, here's a question that is uh, respected. Can we talk about the news of some heat tiles on Dragon being ablated or damaged more than expected? I think this mm -hmm. came from the same briefing that uh, this picture of Cargo Dragon 2 came out of. They were talking about some heat tiles uh, issues, potentially. Do, do you know about that, Chris? Yeah, Hans brought it up and um, caused quite a lot of a stir because he did reference, he was being honest and open about it, that they had some, um, like a vortex issue where was around this certain part of the vehicle, which was causing more um, the erosion, I think the word was, erosion of the mm -hmm. TPS in the heat shield. And that, triggered Wayne Hale <laughs> of all yeah. people, a special program who said he had shivers hearing that because everyone who's into show and not least Wayne Hale, who was just who was a special manager for a long time, put the, it puts the fear of God in you when you hear about TPS damage. But of course it's a different it's a capsule and it's a different kind of thing. It's ablative. So you, you know you'll be careful about what it says. But hands to his credit, we don't know if that's his official account or not. We, we think it is because he's got followers who are also officials, but he replied saying, I will show you. And Wayne Hale said, no, no need. I can't trust you on this. You know, just be careful, you know, because these things, you know, they'll, they'll bite you in the backside. And he's very true about that. I think it was a minor issue that Hans was just being honest about and being, you know, mm -hmm. open to say it was, and that it was then taken as TPS damage. TPS damage is bad. Be careful. You know, what have you, sir? I'm not too concerned by it. It doesn't sound like they were concerned that it was like a major issue. I think it was just slightly more than they expected. And so they're going to look at why it was different than their predictions. But I, I don't think there was any danger arising from this issue. Is that the, the right way to read this, you think? Yeah, there was no danger. Right. Um, but yeah, something they'll look at, of course. Um, let's see. Uh, looking for all the we had a bunch of dragon questions on um, thoughts on the name chosen for crew one capsule if you missed it the crew one capsule does have its name and they revealed it before launch uh, we know the demo two capsule was named uh endeavor and they didn't name that till after it reached orbit um uh, but the crew one capsule is named um the resilience, resilience i believe right yeah and yeah. i think that's a cool name and i was i know some people were expecting it to name it after another shuttle orbiter um i think it's good that they're mixing up and that they're not all just going to be renames from you know prior uh the shuttle orbiters um although there are lots of shuttle orbiter names that i hope they use on new capsules too because there are a lot of good names but resilience i think is a great name um given you know there's a lot of stuff going on in 2020 and i know uh, spacex put out a video uh recapping this demo 2 mission and at the end they said you know they hope it's a bright spot in a rough 2020 something like that um i, I know we were talking about when they named the mars rover perseverance um there's kind of an, uh, another kind of ode to we're persevering a lot of tough stuff going on in the world in this country right now um resilience i think is a great name for the crew one capsule uh, let's see. I'm looking for to see if there's any other dragon questions here. Um, we got a couple ISS questions, so I guess those are related. Um, back to the Antar. Oh, okay. And somehow the internet is always 
very keen to know about the toilets in space because this came up again on the Antares launch. Apparently, a new toilet for the ISS was launched. <laughs> Do we know what was improved on the new toilet launch the, last night? Do we know? Uh, yeah, it's got a very it's more powerful pipe, which um, sucks away the uh, waste materials from astronauts. It's um, a wonderful pipe. It, it's <laughs> certainly worth all the money. <laughs> no, I, don't. I think it's it's mostly related to the recycling clean isn't it the recycling of the waste into um into products they can use again so there's a lot of technology involved it's not just a pipe mm -hmm. but it, it does look like a pipe in a box <laughs> um yeah they're always upgrading those weird things and i, I know a while ago we got a, a status report that we wrote up that you know it was you know in the Na typical nasa technical jargon it was like oh there's a there's a fluid problem related to waste management and when you read the whole thing you realize they're talking about there was like a leak on the toilet on the iss yeah. like a year ago that they were working on and it's these things you have to consider when you're building a spaceship uh thomas great name thomas with the new membership thank you so much for your support uh we got a few time to give through some more questions so i'm going to keep them coming um another iss question the iss only has a few years before retirement will nasa build a new station or will spacex or some other private company or is there no longer a future in the low earth orbit um i'm pretty sure this came up and uh, earlier, Bridenstine said during these briefings that yes, we know the ISS has a has an end of life. It only can uh, exist for so long. It is an aging spaceship in low Earth orbit. But I think Bridenstine stressed that we don't want a gap in low Earth orbit. We were talking about the gap in domestic launch capability after we retired shuttle. We had to wait till Demo Two to launch people to orbit from the U.S. again. That gap is kind of what he's referencing there. We don't want that to happen in low earth orbit so i think before the iss retires there will be not just a firm plan but one that has been put into action for a replacement station or spacecraft in low earth orbit where research and things that the iss supports can continue i know axiom space is like the big one that comes to mind a private company that is wants to add private modules to the iss um, and then i think once the iss retired those modules will actually just break off and become their own space station um, I think Bigelow Aerospace, which we haven't heard from in a little bit, um, we know there was some financial trouble there. We don't think they're gone, um, but I know they're working through some stuff. Um, I know they had plans for a low Earth orbit private space station, um, and I think there might be even a couple other co uh, companies that I'm not thinking of right now. Um, so I think that they, uh, NASA will take use of those, and like they are with commercial crew, um, instead of building their station themselves, I think they'll buy it, buy services from these private companies. They'll say, we're going to buy a Crew Dragon launch to launch our astronauts to this private station, and we're going to pay Axiom Space, for example, um, for access to the station, and we'll conduct our experiments on there and things like that. Um, NASA kind of pivoting their focus towards operating gateway kind of like they operated the iss and make low earth orbit more of a a customer nasa being a customer there um what do, what do you think chris what you just said yeah <laughs> cool yeah. i nailed it covered it <laughs> yeah I, I think it'll be you know nasa doing the same thing they did with commercial crew they're going to operate gateway kind of like they did with the iss uh, because that's a new uh, era or a new area for deep space station uh, and low earth orbit they'll kind of be more of a customer at these private companies um, so yeah, uh, I want to get one more question in before we kind of wrap things up here. Uh, let's see. Um, let's, let's see. When are SpaceX planning on reusing Endeavor? That was the question I was looking for. Another ISS commercial crew question. Um, I believe Endeavor will fly on crew two. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And so they're going to have a new castle for crew one named resilience. Endeavor will fly on Crew 2. I don't know if that means they're only going to rotate those two Crew Dragons or if they'll add a third and kind of rotate three. Um, we'll have to stay tuned on that. But Endeavor flying on Crew 2. There you go. Um, again, thank you guys, everyone, for tuning in and for all of the support. Um, we did, but we talked to the show a lot about Scrubs. And <laughs> I'm going to use that opportunity to plug our merch store really quick because we got a new design on the... Um, nasaspaceflight.com slash shop eat sleep scrub repeat which is what has been happening recently uh i feel like we've got a whole bunch of cool merch and things on the store including the new shirt we've got we're always adding new stuff chris b is wearing why, the orange why rocket good people shirt buy this t-shirt <laughs> chris is wondering why it hasn't been one of our best sellers guys I mean, sls is cool 
There's only me and David David Willis has bought it. <laughs> uh, we've got that shirt. I'm rocking the Endeavor capsule shirt for Crew Dragon. Um, we've got a lot of cool stuff though, over on nasaspacefactcom slash shop. If you want to check it out, please feel free to Ooh. do so. Again, just like all the um, Super Chats and the memberships, those goes directly into supporting the website, the YouTube content, and all of those things that you guys love. Um, so we want to plug those really quick. Um, I also want to thank our members, and I think Michael will bring up our list of memberships. There we go. Not only uh, all of the memberships that we get on these streams, but the launch directors and flight engineers, those top two tiers. We want to give a special thank you to those people who are sending so much support into the channel without that we could not do what we do um so we want to greatly appreciate all of their support um i want to thank michael baylor who was working in the background today um what, managing the overlay and the membership screens you see and all of that stuff a big thank you to him also a big thank you to das who helped set up all of these streams uh, and I want to thank Chris Bergen for joining me, to, me today, managing editor for NASA Spaceflight, um, an orange rocket fan extraordinaire. Um, and my name is Thomas Burkhardt, editor and reporter for NASA Spaceflight. I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. And I hope that we will bring more live coverage and more launch attempts that will not be scrubs. Again, we think the next one will be uh, Starlink on a Falcon 9 no earlier than Monday morning. Stay tuned for that. Um, we will have more videos from Boca Chica via Mary. A big thank you to her um, coming yeah. up on the channel. So if you are not subscribed, why not subscribe to the channel? At enable notifications so you hear when all these new videos and live streams come out. We don't just spam you when we post a video or we go live. It's because something's cool is going on. Um, so stay tuned for all of that. And of course, you can follow us on social media. Chris manages the NASA Space Flight at NASA Space Flight Twitter account. And you can find me at TGMetsFan98. Um, and we will be tweeting all of the recent news and keeping you up to date on those launch attempts on Starship news and everything else going on in space flight. Uh, but for now, that is going to do it for this week's episode of NASA Space Flight Live. Thank you for coming. Hope to see you guys next week and on future live streams. But until then, see you guys next time. Pressure looks good. Following up. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these.